So, uh, Professor Nichols, uh, maybe you can prepare for everything, uh, the phone, the laptop, your material, and soon after you're comfortable with yourself and you're ready, then we can start our lecture today. Okay, perfect. So we are going to start. Uh, Whenever you're ready, Professor, just take your time, it's okay. Okay, so please let me let me know if you can see my my slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll put it here. Yes, it loud and clear. <laughs> oh, just a minute. Okay, now I'm good for this. Okay, can you see it? Yeah, uh, now it's in the square mode, right? You haven't, okay, it's a okay. presentation now. Uh, Perfect, thank you. Okay, but before we start our lecture today, uh, can I introduce you once again to the audience here? Uh, probably some of the audience uh, didn't follow your last lecture, is it okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen and dear students of Brawijaya University, also from outside University of Brawijaya, uh, let's start our lecture today. And it's a really, really beautiful day that we once again have Professor Nikos uh, from University of California, Berkeley to be the lecturer uh, in today's lecture and the topics is about vulnerability of agroecosystem to pest problems but before we conduct the lecture today i would like to once again share uh, the inspirative bios of professor nichols particularly to my dear students uh, this is one of the good example of inspiring persons and hopefully you can uh, go with her path one day. So Professor Clara mm. Nichols is a Colombian agronomist with a master in entomology from the Colegio de Postgraduados Capingo, Mexico, and a PhD in entomology and biological control of insect pests from the University of California, Davis. She is a permanent lecturer on sustainable rural development in Latin America at the University of California, <coughs> She also teaches at Santa Clara University in California and various universities in Colombia, Brazil, Nicaragua, Argentina, Spain, and Italy. Currently, she serves as the president of the Latin American Scientific Society of Agroecology, or SOCLA, and is the regional coordinator of REDARDRES a network of Latin American researchers exploring ways to evaluate and enhance resiliency of farming systems to climate change. Her research has centered on enhancing plant biodiversity of farms to provide habitat and foster natural enemies of insect pests in a range of farming systems. She is also working on methodologies to evaluate the resilience of farms to climate change and based on such assessments in designing agroecological interventions to enhance the adaptability of farming systems to climatic extremes. She is the author of five books, among them Biodiversity and Pest Management in Agroecosystems and of more than 60 scientific journal papers. She is currently a co-director of the Centro Latino Americano de Investigaciones Agroecologicas, or CELIA, based in Colombia. And today, Professor Nichols will uh, continue uh, her lecture. The first lecture of Professor Nichols talk about biodiversity, and then uh, continue by uh, her husband, Professor Altieri. Uh, he talked last Friday about the designing of agroecosystems. And today, I, I'm sure it's gonna be a really exciting day because uh, she will also give knowledge and inspiration to us about the vulnerability of agroecosystems to pest problems. And for the participants who would like to uh, ask questions, you can both raise your hand or uh, drop your question in the chat room. 
by giving your name and your affiliations. So ladies and gentlemen, for no further ado, please welcome Professor Nichols. Time is yours. Just a minute because I had a problem here. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, um, Professor Rina, for the invitation again. I'm very happy to collaborate with the Indonesian universities and also with uh, Haya University. Um, this is our fourth time, I think, last year and this year is, is the second one. And today I want to talk about vulnerability of agroecosystem to pest problems. And uh, I think the first thing that we need to, to talk, and probably in, in other lectures we have emphasized that agriculture is the modification of nature. And uh, it's very important to understand that uh, in a natural forest, we, we don't have to intervene as a humans because all the process, ecological processes are functioning very well. So, but once we decrease the biodiversity to implement, for example, a simple, a simplified monoculture like a paddy rice, you can see how we can reduce the biodiversity because you cut the forest in order to implement this homogeneous monoculture. But um, to maintain the high productivity Activity of this paradise, we need to increase the, the external input the management intensity started to increase. So I think it's very important to know the relationship between the degree of human intervention and the biodiversity loss. And why I'm saying this? Because many modern practices are uh, tried to erode all these um, strengths that the system used to have. For example, the, the best characteristics of the, uh, uh, the agroecosystem is the interdependency, the self-regulating, self-renewing, self-sufficiency, efficiency, and diversity. But the problem is with the modern practices, we are trying to uh, erode and reduce all these good strengths that we have that we have in these modern systems. So you can see that these modern practices uh, erode this, and for that we need to start um, using a lot of um, a lot of inputs in order to maintain um, the stability and the productivity of this system. And for that reason. Here you can see the intervention in paradigm, the therapeutic approach, the specialization and centralization, and high import and high export, because in the natural forest, we don't harvest anything. And, but in the agroecosystem, we export all the products, and, or many, a lot of products. And um, for that, we erode all these um, pillar strengths that are very important for the uh, stability of the system. So this is more or less what we have. Uh, and you can see this is the degree of environmental simplification. And you, you can see what are the needs for increased artificial control. If you are in a, a very close to natural ecosystem, as I said before, in the natural ecosystem, for example, we have pests. We have pests because we have also a community of natural enemies that maintain the pests in check. So there is a, a lot of stability. We don't need to fertil use fertilizer in the natural ecosystem because there is a lot of nutrient cycling in this natural ecosystem. There is a lot of um, uh, organic matter and many organisms that are playing that role. But once we started to establish in, in, an agriculture, you can see that we have a, a different kind of agroecosystem that are very close to to natural ecosystem or very artificial intensified uh, agroecosystems. So for example, uh, one of the systems that are very close to natural ecosystem are the traditional polyculture that many small farmers are using in different parts of the world. And if we move 
in, in the simplification, we can find, for example, modern fruit orchards here that perennials are maintaining certain kind of a, a structural system very close to natural ecosystem. But we can have both. We can have organic um, orchards that use, for example, cover crops and they maintain the ground vegetation and they, they start in certain kind of processes that are very important. They are more close to, uh, to these systems. They, they need less inputs um, in terms of, of in, from outside compared with the modern orchard or the conventional orchard that are totally just, they have a huge monoculture of vineyards or apple orchard or, or different kind of orchards that don't have any uh, ground vegetation and they use a lot of inputs. And if we move to the monoculture, annual modern monoculture, like for example, raw crops, vegetables, small grains, even alfalfa, they are far away from the logic of the natural ecosystem and they need a lot of input. They are very dependent on external inputs to maintain the productivity and their stability. So for that reason, we need to talk about those systems. Uh, in the case of industrial agriculture, is associated with the package a package of agrochemical, genetic, and mechanized technologies. And unfortunately, this system has become a major force modifying the, the bio, biosphere. 80% of 1.5 billion hectares of global arable land is under homogeneous monoculture like those that you see in this picture. And uh, in contrary, many small peasant agriculture, they keep this mosaic of crops surrounded by natural vegetation. This is the case here in Latin America where peasant, farming in, peasant farmers in, in Guatemala uh, maintain this mosaic of agriculture surrounded by natural vegetation where, where uh, this ecological landscape matrix plays a very important role in the function of the agroecosystem. Why? Because farmers harvest the litter of the natural forest and not bring not only organic matter, but they also bring a lot of microorganisms that are going to play a, a very important role in, in, in the soil, but also in the pest regulation and disease, and disease control. Uh, and in this particular case, the huge monoculture, they don't have this kind of biodiversity that are going to help to maintain the stability. For that reason, they, they need uh, the, the, the fertilizer, they need the agrochemicals to maintain, in this particular case, the pests in check. So these systems are very productive, but they are very vulnerable. So I think it's very important to compare the structure and the functional differences between natural ecosystem and agroecosystem. So for example, in terms of a net productivity, a natural ecosystem obviously is medium compared with the agroecosystem that is very high. A trophic change in the natural ecosystem, we have a trophic change compared with the agroecosystem that is simple or linear. The species diversity in the agroecosystem is very low compared with the natural ecosystem that is very high. It, the same with genetic diversity is low in the agroecosystem, especially in the conventional agroecosystem. Um, is dominated by one um, genetic diversity, one variety. And uh, in the natural ecosystem, we have high genetic diversity. In, stem, in, terms, in terms of resiliency, uh, natural ecosystems are more resilient than the agroecosystems, especially simple agroecosystem or conventional agroecosystem. And in, the, in terms of human control, uh, in agroecosystem, the, the humans are the ones who uh, 
um, uh, decide and depend on this uh, on the on this control. The the humans are the ones who are providing the the inputs to maintain the stability. And in the natural ecosystem, you don't need this uh, intervention. And the habitat heterogeneity is very simple in the agri ecosystem compared with the uh, uh, with the natural ecosystem. And and I think uh, 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 in terms of the phenology in the agri ecosystem is synchronized, in the natural ecosystem is seasonal. And there are other characteristics that probably uh, uh, you are going to read later. Okay, so I think uh, uh, we need to also understand the in the comparison between ecosystem and agroecosystem in different uh, processes. For example, in terms of energy flow, the agroecosystem become open system where considerable energy is directed out of the system at the time of harvest. So we harvest all this um, energy uh, compared with the nutrient cycling where we have a lot of recycling of nutrients um, and uh, also um, it, it maintain the energy within the, this natural ecosystem. Um, so we don't need to uh, maintain this, this, the bare soil in this uh, natural ecosystem compared with the uh, agroecosystem. In terms of population regulating mechanism, biological control, for example, when we have, when we reduce the diversity uh, to, to establish this agroecosystem, so, uh, and this system become very simplified and uh, there is a danger of invasions and catastrophic pests or disease outbreak. And it happens mainly in a conventional agroecosystem compared with the natural ecosystem. And the other thing that is important in the succession, agricultural field usually represents secondary succession stage where an existing community is dis disrupted by deforestation and when you plow the, 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 the field. So in an in a agricultural field, we create an imma, immature and man-made plant community. And there is a tendency towards complexity in the case of, of, uh, of uh, natural ecosystem. And the other um, characteristic that is very important is stability. Uh, when we reduce this structural and functional diversity in, in comparison with natural ecosystem, this agroecosystem have lower resiliency and, than the natural ecosystem. And, in, and for that reason, the stability is very vulnerable, I can say. It's very vulnerable compared with uh, natural ecosystems. So I think it's very, uh, in this particular case, when we are talking about vulnerability, we need to um, and understand very well the monoculture, how the monocultures work. Because monoculture probably may have temporary economic advantage for farmers because it's very productive, but in the long term, they do not represent an ecological optimum because you are reducing and reducing and reducing the diversity and you are losing all these properties that are very important for to maintain um, the, the productivity. So the drastic narrowing or cultivated plant diversity has put the world's food production in a greater peril. So this is very dangerous. And the other thing that is, is, is important for you to know is that out of 20, 250,000 planting species and known to humankind, more than 30,000 plant species are edible. A lot of uh, small farmers and indigenous people eat more than, than, than uh, a lot of um, species that, that they eat that we don't know. And I think it's very important that we start uh, 
having that kind of, of relationship with these uh, traditional um, communities or indigenous communities that have a lot of knowledge about uh, these um, um, plants. Um, about 7,000 have been used for food and um, some 120 are cultivated today. Nine provide more than 75% of human food, but only three, three species provide more than 50% of the human food. And out of eight, this is, this is, I think this is something that shocked me. Um, 50 are cultivated in large scale out of eight to 10,000 crop species that we have. 50 are cultivated in large scale and four crops provide 60% of human calories. And you know what those crops are, you know, maize, wheat, rice, that are part of our diet and soy that are part of our diet, especially in, in uh, talking about calories. And this genetic uniformity creates a lot of vulnerability. Most major crops are uh, uniform genetically and they are very vulnerable to epidemics and to climate variability climatic variability, climate change, you know, those systems are more vulnerable to climate change. However, this uniformity derives from power economic interests and legislative forces that are telling our countries what do we need to produce and they are holding mainly corporate power. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm a dog here. And uh, you can see this uh, slide that is very interesting because you can see that century ago in 1903, commercial seeds offer hundreds of varieties. You can see here, hundreds of varieties of different crops from sweet corn, lettuce, um, radish, squash, tomato, cucumber, cabbage, hundreds of varieties. But 80 years later, by 1983, few of those were found in the National Seed Storage Laboratory. So you can see the genetic erosion in, in that we have in 80 years. So we have less varieties, but I think in this table, you can see the, um, the you can see the different genetic uniformity in several in several crops. Like for example, rice in Sri Lanka, the number of varieties from 2,000 varieties that they used to have in 1959, now they have less than 100. So 75 percent descend from the a common stock that they used to have. The same in Bangladesh, the same in Indonesia. Look at what happened in Indonesia. In rice, 74% of the variety descend from the common stock, your center of origin of rice. So it's, um, this, is, this is something that we need to re, um, do a, a deep reflection about why and uh, what have been the main reason for reducing the genetic diversity that you used to have. The same with wheat, potatoes, and soybean in the United States. This is kind of a tendency worldwide, especially in the center of origin. The same, this is the reduction of diversity in fruits and vegetables from 1903 to 1983. But you can see different kind of vegetables and no, look the numbers in 1903 compared with 1983. So the losses, the percentage of losses uh, went from 97 to 89. So very huge percentage of losses of genetic diversity. And what is the problem if we are losing this genetic diversity? 
is because this genetic homogeneity take us to a high vulnerability and we have past failures due to crop uniformity and we have to learn the lesson from the past. Look what happened with the uh, famine in Ireland with the, when, the, when they reduced the potato diversity so they, they have this effect. The same with in the United States with wheat when they had the rustic epidemic that was very dramatic in the 60s. And then in, the, in 1984, the, the citrus um, um, virus um, destroyed more than eight, 18 million trees due to this uh, genetic uniformity. And the same here in Indonesia, and in 1974, in this table, they talk about 3 million tons were destroyed due to um, uh, this genetic uniformity. So, and in, in the United States, we have several experiences that demonstrate that, for example, um, the epidemic of the, the, corn, the corn leaf epidemic in the, in the 70s uh, reduced the maize crop from, from 119 million tons in, in 1969 to 105 million tons in 1970. So I think it's very important to see these, these statistics from the United States and um, also the reduction in, in production because this is sometimes what the Minister of Agriculture pay more attention. And it, it, the losses was a equivalent to 18.5 trillion calories. So it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of calories that were lost due to this particular disease. And um, what is the influence or intensification of biodiversity and the function in agroecological system? You can see that we have productivity is very linked to sustainability, but we need to have a, a lot of, um, our interest is to see how the ecosystem function and how we can increase this because what it costs the, the ecosystem function or, or the problem that we have is the reduction in biodiversity because we, we reduce the plant biodiversity and we destroy the, the habitat for natural enemies and mainly what, what I said in summary is the agricultural intensification and specialization reduce the biodiversity, the arthropod biodiversity, and we change the ecosystem function. We, know, we don't have any more natural control and the sustainability and the productivity is in risk. And uh, the other thing that in this, um, in, in talking about the vulnerability, we need to understand what are the root causes of the dysfunction of this uh, uh, agroecosystem immune dysfunction. Why we have those problems? Why we are creating a, this uh, vulnera vulnerability with this kind of agroecosystem? And it's because we have excess of pesticides, we have a sex of fertilizers, we have low soil organic matter content, a low soil bio, biological activity. With all these fertilizers and these pesticides are affecting the soil biology. And the structure that we used to have in this uh, agroecosystem are mainly monoculture with low functional biodiversity, dominated with genetic, with one, one variety. And we have a lot of problems related to nutrient deficiencies, moisture imbalances, and probably I can add one that is more vulnerable to climate change. So we need to understand the ecological consequence of the monoculture with a special reference to pest problems and the agro agrochemical treadmill. So we have here the structure, the monoculture. And what we did with the monoculture, we reduced the vegetation, the natural vegetation displacement, 
in order to advance the size of monoculture. Once we destroy the natural vegetation, we uh, create this disruption of beneficial fauna because they don't have the habitat anymore. And we have the massive supply of host plants. We are all the area that were in natural forest. Now we have this massive supply of host plant. And sometimes uh, we have a host plant switch. So many insects, phytophagous insects that were probably feeding on certain native plants or in, in the forest, they make a switch and they start uh, becoming a pest. Um, and the other aspect that is important to, to realize when you advance in the monoculture, in the size of the monoculture due to the deforestation, you reduce this biodiversity, you disrupt the natural biological control, and you recruit more, you have this recruitment of herbivores. And in situ competition of the life cycle of these insects, and we have more pest problem. This is just only because we have this natural vegetation displacement. But look what happened when you are start using in the, this monoculture, you are using a lot of fertilizers. When you are using fertilizers, you create nutritional imbalance in crops. And some insect, um, so the plants are more susceptible and higher, they, they, they spread higher vulnerability to pests. So now we have more pest problem. And when you are using intensive pesticides, what happens if you are using herbicides? Sometimes you eliminate, or most of the time you eliminate the trap crops and even insectary plants that are harboring natural enemies with these herbicides. And you are using insecticides, you can eliminate natural enemies or you can cause resistant to ins insecticides and you can have pest resurgency, resurgence or secondary pests. So now we have more pest problem. And this is uh, the, the result. We have the pesticide treadmill, treadmill lower um, effectiveness of insecticides, higher use of insecticides, higher cost of the production because you have to use more pesticides and in many cases, yield decline in the long term. Okay, what are the factors in influencing pest vulnerability in the agroecosystem? So we need to divide it in, in, in several factors. So the, the first factor is landscape simplification. So with agriculture, the, the original flora and fauna that are completely replaced over a vast landscape. So you eliminate the natural vegetation to, to establish this huge monoculture. This agroecosystem with a poor surrounding matrix, because you can see this is soybean in, in Argentina, they don't have a nature matrix. And this, are, uh, um, this is unfavorable environment for natural enemies. And this insect cannot control the pests. So you need a lot of inputs. So make the system more vulnerable. For example, what happened in the United States with the simplification in forest states of the Midwest, you know, Midwest is, is the center, in the center of the United States are the corn bell. And they started to increase the planting of com, corn monoculture because the demand of biofuels. And there are huge monoculture and it resulted in a lower diversity of landscape. So just dominated with monoculture and and they decrease the supply of natural enemies of insect pet in soybean and in corn. And they reduce the biological control by 24%. This loss of biological control costs to soy producer an estimated of $58 million per year. 
They experience also a yield reduce and increase on pesticide use. So you can see that just the landscape, the, the advancing on monoculture create all these problems are a lot of economic losses. And you can see here, what is the, the situation? We reduce the biodiversity. And this is like I showed you last time, but I think it's very important because it's related to, to rice. And you can see that the, in this system, in this paddy rice that are surrounded by natural vegetation, the, the, this is, um, um, these graphs explore the abundance of predators are higher in diversified system that are surrounding with this, uh, this farm that are surrounding by this matrix compared with monoculture rice farms, you know, that have less predators. And this is more or less the effects. Once you have plant diversification, you can enhance predator abundance, you can reduce pest abundance, you can increase yield, and at the same time, you can reduce the insecticide use. And also, you have more economic benefits because you are not in debt and you can reduce the cost of production. And it's very important to understand that these ecological or landscape matrices are um, habitat for all these natural enemies that are very important for the control of many pests. They are generalists, but they play a very important role in the, uh, in the pest regulation. So when we have low diversity landscape, probably they may not support any natural enemy population like in this particular case. So what do we need to do? We need to restore, do a, a, an ecological restoration because with this we can um, uh, ensure or guarantee that we provide the, the habitat and the resources that natural enemy needs to move into the farms. Another factor that is very, um, that is part of this analysis of factor of vulnerability is the pesticide induced insect outbreak. Because when we start using pesticides, some of them are fail to control the target pests or create new, new pest problems or secondary pest problems. And why? Because some of them develop resistance um, and, and in, in many cases, it's because they, they use continually the, the same pesticides and they can lead to pest control failure. Also, pesticides can foster outbreak of pests through the elimination. When you are using this pesticide, they eliminate natural enemies. And predators and parasites offer often experience high mortality than herbivores. So they are very susceptible to this pesticide. Even, even botanical pesticides are very uh, harmful to, to natural enemies. And I think this is, is very important in order to understand what happened when you remove, remove a beneficial insect. This is a, a very Interesting uh, research was done in Erie Farm in long time ago, but I think it's, it's very currently in terms of what, what they discovered is that in these plots that are very small, 4.5 meter plots, <clears throat> and they have one meter borders. And they, they, they try to observe what happened when you remove the, the natural, sorry, I don't see what happened. Okay, when you remove the natural enemies and uh, look what happened. If you start, um, for example, when you use insecticide in, in this plot versus the plot that you don't with any pesticides, you can see here when you use the insecticides, in many times application, in this application, 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 compared with this, that, that the population, you know, 
can be uh, dramatically, but you can develop resistance when you start using uh, pesticides compared when you don't treat with any pesticide. <clears throat> and what is the, the services that we are protecting in this case? The ecosystem service, the biological control. <clears throat> Spiders, for example, in insecticide treated versus untreated fields, you can see that the population of the spiders are very high here in where we, we date after hunting, but you can reduce the population of spider when you use these pesticides very quickly. And in the case of um, developed resistance, I think the example, the best example is that all the cases that we had in the resistant cases in cotton in that pest resurgent secondary pest outbreak due to the resistance of many pesticides. And we have a, a very important examples in Peru, the catastrophe, catastrophe in Peru, in, in Brazil, in India, in Egypt, in Nicaragua, many farmers lost everything everything due to the crisis of pesticides in cotton. And the other thing that is, is, is very important to understand that this outbreak, this is the case in, in San Joaquin Valley in California, where you, you can see all the sprays and all the outbreaks of these adults in untreated, untreated um, um, experiments. And this is mainly due to the application of pesticides. And here we have one of the major pests in cotton with the ligus, that is a, a very important pest in cotton. And it was a, a big outbreak and many farmers uh, have a, a huge economic losses. And not only economic losses, but they lost all these beneficial insects that were very, very important in the control of ligus like lacewing, orius, navis, geocoris, and silos other that are very useful now in, in organic cotton. And, and I think it's, it's another aspect that is very important to recognize is that the world used now more than 5.2 billion pounds of, of pesticides on herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides. And you can see here that even from 2000 to 2012, you, you can see that despite the, all the research that we had been done in, in, is in the benefits of natural enemies, in the um, problem associated with pesticides, in many countries, they still use more pesticides than, than before. Look what happened in Europe, look what happened in Asia. In 2008, they increased the use of pesticides, the global pesticide cell increase, and the same in Latin America. And I think the future chemical warfare against pests, we lost that because in the United States, agricultural losses due to pests reached 32% in the 50s and 37% in the 90s. And today is more or less the same. And the problem is that more than 450 species of arthropods are resistant to more than 1,000 different pesticides. And <clears throat> you can see here the, the number of, of the number of species of insect diseases and weeds that are resistant to at least one pesticide. So we have more than 450 species of insects, uh, diseases, and weed. So we are in what we call the pesticide treadmill due to international technological packages that are associated with agrochemicals, machinery, equipment, implements, seeds, now with tragenics, you know, telling the farmer what to do, how to do it, and without understanding the, the consequence uh, in the long term, but also the, the, the major causes that made the system more vulnerable. And this is what the pesticide treadmill is all about. You know, 
you, you apply the product and probably the pest is controlled and you continue using the same product and you have pesticide, pests become resistant, you apply another product and pests become more resistant or you start having secondary outbreak, you kill natural enemies and you have to apply a more and more frequently another pesticide. So farmers are always running um, behind the pest problem. So what we are saying here in agroecology is that we need to understand the root cause of the problem. And another factor that I think is very important uh, that we discuss is the fertilizer induced pest outbreak. There are so many studies documenting the lower abundance of several insects, especially herbivores, in organic farmers um, that um, are attributed to, to the reduction of low nitrogen content in, in organically farming crops. And I wanted to show this example because uh, you can see here, this is the comparison, the effect between soil, soil fertility and pests. And you can see the population of white fly in a, in a system fertilized with conventional fertilizer compared with the, compared with the um, organic fertilizer. Why do we have more pests when we fertilize our crops with, com with chemicals compared with organic is because especially with homopterans, the, 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 in the case of nitrogen, when you apply chemical nitrogen, the plant cannot assimilate, assimilate the, the nitrogen in protein and amino acids, and you have a lot of free nitrogen in the plant. So this homopteran started to develop very quickly. And this is the reason why we have this pest outbreak compared with when we fertilize the crop with organic fertilizers. Because here is a, a slow release of the nitrogen and the plant can assimilate it in, in amino acids and proteins so they cannot leave this uh, nitrogen free for pests, especially in, in homopteran pests. And this is another example with the European corn borer. And you can see that it's very simple experiment where you collect soil from conventional farms and organic farms, and you put it in, in, in pots and you put it in the greenhouse and you plant the corn. And then you put randomly and release a female of the corn borer, of the, of the pest to lay eggs in this. And you can see here that the, the pests lay eggs, the plants that are coming with, that they have conventional soil compared with organic soil. So the question is why? Why did the, the insect prefer the plant that is, is planted in, in conventional soil and it's, this is associated with the, with the um, odor. There are certain uh, odors that attract the pests to this system. And if we add um, ammonium nitrate to this plant, you can see that now the effect is the contrary. In the organic, they lay more eggs. And if we add compost, it's totally different. So I think it's very important, as, at least for us, for the students that are studying and for us that we are entomologists, that at the beginning we were just putting attention on the pests and, and the control and beneficial insects, but we didn't pay attention how the system was um, using the inputs or what kind of input they were using in terms of uh, chemical or organic. And now this is a, a correlation between fertilizer and pests. And this is, uh, this is another, another uh, research that we did in California. And you can see the effects of input of nitrogen fertilizer on aphids and the natural limits in, in wheat fields. And you can see here the abundance of, of 
the abundance of, of uh, aphids and the natural enemies in this in this system. This is the input of net of nitrogen fertilizer, and you can see the abundance of pests in a, in a chemical compared with the organic fertilizer. This is the the effects of aphids, and natural enemies also are decreased. And the same here, you can see the uh, this is in broccoli plants, a uh, different sample dates using monoculture and uh, in a polyculture with buckwheat. So we are comparing the polyculture versus the monoculture and using a organic and, fer and chemical fertilizer. And you can see that with syn synthetic fertilizer, the population of aphid is higher than in an organic fertilizer. The same, this is in summer, this is in autumn. And you can see here when we compare the monoculture using compost or the, or the polyculture broccoli and, um, and bagwheat together, the population is lower when we have polyculture and we have uh, organic fertilizers. And also the parasitism is also influenced if you, if you have um, using different kind of uh, fertilizer. If you use synthetic fertilizers, you can see the percentage of parasitiz parasitization in, in the summer, is lower than in the in the plot that we have organic fertilizers. The, the percentage of parasitism in in of aphid cabbage cabbage aphid is, is higher in an organic system. So I think it's, it's, it's very important to realize the relationship between um, pests and um, and soil fertility and the, the kind of input that we are using. And also farming system simplification um, is one of the causes of the problem. So we are simplifying the system in order to be more productive, but at the same time we have more pest problems. Another factor that, uh, uh, that we need to discuss at the, at, the, at the farm level is that we decrease on-farm plant diversity. This is the case of, of decrease of diversity in the agroecosystem and um, other in, invasive species. Um, we get the opportunity to colonize and lead in more, um, more herbivore insect abundance. But when we mix different species um, with the host, we say that the host is corn, we create this, con this, this condition for the natural enemies to establish. So one thing that we need to do is try to diversify the agroecosystem. So in order to overcome the pesticide treadmill, we need, we need to replace monoculture with complex agricultural systems where beneficial fauna thrives. This is the kind of, of, of diversified farming systems. And this gives the farmers greater autonomy. Uh, they don't depend on expensive inputs for pest control, and they depend mainly on this ecological process, these natural limits that are going to control the pests. But this only happens if we have this functional biodiversity. And polyculture is one strategy to diversify the system. So for example, here, corn and, and beans, we have a, a complex system that uh, they complement each other. So the complementarity and the synergies here are very important properties because the pollen of corn attract natural enemies that are going to control the pests of the beans and the beans fix nitrogen that the corn is going to use. Here we have more probability for natural enemies to try because the ecological infrastructure made the system more uh, attractive to natural enemies. And if we have, for example, cabbage, here is corn, beans, and I'm sorry, squash, um, we don't have weeds because the squash have certain allelopathic chemical compounds that especially when in a, in a tropical, or in, in the tropics, when rains, 
they wash the, the leaves and this uh, chemical substance inhibit the, the emergency of emergence of, of weeds. So there are several strategies how we can increase biodiversity and reduce the possibility of pest buildup. If we are working with annual crop baits, we need to move from monoculture using rotation that break the cycle of, of, of pests and diseases. And um, we also can have mis, mis cropping systems or strict cropping. This is one strategy. But if we are in the perennial crop base, we can move from orchard using cover crop, plantations, agroforestry to tropical home gardens that are more diversified. So there are complex interactions that I don't have time to discuss, but just look this main, main uh, um, title, the influence of fertility, they help in the decomposition, they, 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 they uh, reduce pest abundance, they increase insect diversity, and they provide more crop biomass and productivity. You can increase yield and fodder. And also we have wheat diversity that play important roles as, as we discussed later. And this is the two hypotheses, how we explain why in a polyculture we have less pest problem than in the monoculture. So you can see here, this is a, a monoculture and the two hypotheses that we use to explain this is that in a monoculture, you have a, you have a, you offer more resources for the pests. So you offer the host plan, and insects can uh, uh, can arrive very quickly. So this is the hypothesis of concentration of resources for the pests. And the the other hypothesis that we are using is um, the hypothesis of natural enemies. So in a polyculture, we have less pest problem because we have the conditions for natural enemies to establish. So we had the ecological infrastructure, we had the host plant mixed with the non-host plant, and we had pollen and nectar that provide the condition for the natural enemies to establish here in a polyculture. <sighs> Sorry. And I think one aspect of my research, and I, 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 I really want to, to um, hope, I, I really wanted to inspire other students, new students to do this kind of research that are very important for us, that uh, because we need to demonstrate that there are a lot of intera benefit interaction when we have diversified agroecosystem. From from from, uh, from the corn or from the borders into the corn or into the crop, this is um, sweet potato and surrounded by by corn. And what we will have with with another crop that is here, another strip cropping that is here, we have interaction with them, and we have a lot of um, cilia formicarius that is one of the major pests of sweet potato. The pollen of corn attract natural enemies that are coming here and control. Or um, another, in, in, when we have a trick cropping, what is the interaction between the pests that we have in corn and versus the natural enemies that are moving from the corn into the, into the field? Or when we have ca a cassava with corn, what are the interaction between corn and cassava? Talking about the relationship between natural enemies and pests. So I think it's very important not just looking on pests and natural enemies interaction, but all the interaction associated with crops. Let's say that we have here a crops, different crops. It could be in polyculture, it could be in strict cropping, it could be in, in different um, the arrangement. And so what kind of, 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 of organisms are associated with the, these crops? We have mycorrhiza in the roots, we have a lot of microbiota that play an important role in, 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 in 
disease management or disease control, but also in soil fertility. Pollinators that are very important associated with crops. We have the composer of plant biomass that interact with this uh, uh, microbiota. We have natural enemies, uh, parasitoid pathogens, antagonists that are very important for the crops and they, they maintain the pests in check. But we also have pathogen, parasitoid and, and, and pests and weeds that we need to reduce. So these kind of interactions are very important to know uh, according to the crops that we are working with. So if we had this system that this is an organic um, lettuce production in California, we understand that also the organic monoculture are vulnerable and there is an urgent need to do the transition toward a diversified uh, vegetable production, in this case, lettuce production, because uh, this is how we break the monoculture with diversity. And this, in this case, we use Lobularia manitima uh, because they have a lot of pollen and nectar for parasitoids, especially, uh, because we wanted to increase the, the, the parasitization of many Lepidoptera and pests that are the major pests in lettuce. And, but it's very important to know how far we are going to establish this corridor in order to maintain the pests in check. And uh, you need to understand that in the case of parasitoid, they can fly up to 50 meters and 50 meters in that way. So we need to establish these corridors every 100 meters to maintain the, res the habitat and the resources that natural enemies need, that is pollen, nectar, and, and refuge. Okay. The other kind of diversity that I want to talk that I think is very important in terms of vulnerability is the crop genetic diversity. Um, because sometimes as it happened with us in Japan, the farmers don't want to plant other crops, but they can diversify their system. They say this farmer just wanted to plant lettuce. And by one way to diversify the production of lettuce is using a, a, a good diversity of lettuce. Or you wanted to plant just beans, you need to work with this kind of diversity, uh, a lot of varieties of, 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 of beans. Why? Because in terms of diseases, you know that in order to have um, the, the disease, we need to have these three conditions. The, susceptible host or crop or cultivar, a, a, a virulent pathogen, and a favorable environment condition. High temperature, high humidity, you can uh, have the disease, okay? So what, what thing, uh, what aspect we can um, manage? Uh, we can work on creating certain kind of um, uh, manipulate certain kind of, uh, of of the environment, but it's very difficult. But at least in in vineyards, what we are doing is open windows to circulate or to create like a a microclimatic uh, condition that uh, reduce the the humidity. That could be one option to control. Um, yield. The, the pathogen we cannot control. It's very difficult because it can arrive from the wind, coming from the wind, or, but we can um, work on the host. So we can start um, having more varieties that are more tolerant to this particular uh, races of the pathogen. So we can work on host plant resistant uh, pathogen also can have multiple isolate, but we can work on the vertical resistance or horizontal resistance because the vertical are working against some genotypes of the pathogen and horizontal resistance are not limited to certain genotypes across all isolate. So host genetic diversity is important to slow the epidemic. So you can see here that it's very important to aquí here, for example, this variety have low level horizontal resistance, 
and this is the races of, of, of different kind of races. And this is a um, high level of horizontal resistance that is very important. Compared with this vertical resistance that's just resistant to two races of the pathogen. Okay, and here we have um, vertical resistance to races one and four and high level horizontal resistance to two, three, five, and six. So if you ask me what variety do I prefer? I prefer this one that is resistant to more races of the pathogen, medium resistant or tolerance compared with when you have just a lot of resistant to just one race of the pathogen, but you don't know what kind of race are going to arrive. So you need to be prepared. So this strategy is to anticipate what is to be, to, to prepare for something that is going to happen. And for this genetic diversity is very important to prevent pest problem, uh, disease problems. And it's the same here, um, this is one, um, this is an episodia where we have high temperature, high humidity and a, a virulent pathogen. And this is a monoculture dominated with one variety, 100% that we are going to have this episode event. But we have uh, two varieties, one is tolerant and the other is, is vulnerable. We have 50% chance that we are going to have this uh, disease. And if we increase the number of varieties, probably we can uh, reduce the probability that we are going to have an episode. And this is what farmers are doing in Chile. This is wheat. Uh, the Chilotan um, Huilliche Indians in Chile, in the South of Latin America, in the last country in, in, Latin, in, in South America, the indigenous people are using a mix of varieties of wheat. They mix everything together and different varieties, traditional varieties that are very important, um, the quality of the grain and they have several qualities and also because they make a, an amazing bread due to this um, mix of varieties, but also they, they reduce the risk. And you can see here the case of barley uh, when we have blends, we have less mildew than when we have a, just one variety. This is the levels, the, the mildew, the barley mildew levels percentage. So you can see the percentage of mildew in this mix of variety of, 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 of blend of, of, of barley, you know, compared with, with monoculture, with one variety. And the same work with Professor Xu in, in China that I think is, is very interesting work. Um, they developed this idea and create the rice intercropping system that was very interesting using varieties, tall varieties with short varieties. And this is uh, with rice. And they were using this as a physical barrier for the dispersal of the pathogen. This tall variety it's like a physical barrier for the pathogen. They cannot disperse to another place, but also all the, these varieties uh, create a microclimate, macro environment or microclimatic environment here compared you have all the varieties at the same height. And, and this mixture of susceptible and resistant varieties of right, um, civic high yields, 89% higher, and 98% of lower disease of rice blast fungus. And the growing distance between varieties dilute the inoculum because it creates this uh, microclimatic condition. And also high varieties uh, determine this, this uh, temperature and humidity that are less favorable to the disease. This is a very important paper. I, I encourage you to read this paper because it has, um, the, the, they demonstrate that this is not just for half an hectare, they in huge amount of land um, showing that it's possible to miss varieties to reduce the pest problem. Okay, another factor that I wanted to discuss with you um, made the system more vulnerable to pests is climate change. 
because now we have many weeds, insect pests, and fungi that thrive under warmer temperatures. On the, um, and also when we increase the CO2 levels, they thrive very quickly. So the range and distribution of weeds and pests are likely to increase with climate change. So we have now new pests that we don't know too much about them. And many farmers have to deal with this situation. And so this could be, could create more problems to farmers and, um, and also they don't know the life cycle. They don't know how to treat the pests. So this is a new, um, a new problem for farmers. So what we are doing right now is to work on the risk of farmers um, evaluating the risk. And we try to do this using this formula that is um, risk is equal to three. For vulnerability, we use several indicators of vulnerability over reactive capacity and recovery. So we want to, to see how vulnerable are the system and if they have the capacity to react and to recover. So vulnerability is the condition that determined by physical, social, and economic and environmental factor or processes which increase the susceptibility of an agroecosystem to the impacts. It could be pests, it could be disease, or it could be climate change. And the adaptive capacity is the combination of all the strengths, attributes, resources available within a farm or a, or a rural community to manage and reduce the disaster. It could be the risk to pests or the, or the risk to hurricane and strength the resiliency. So this is in the summary of our research. So we try to observe what are the socioecological features that determine the vulnerability and the reactive capacity of farmers to enhance the resilience. And we observe that the, this climatic risk uh, is due to this uh, threat that could be, um, and also it depends on the vulnerability of the system and the response capacity. So what we did was to discover certain kind of indicators for all of this. In the case of threat, um, the intensity, frequency, and even the yield losses or damage level is very similar in a region. So for that reason, we decided to have this as a constant for the whole community. And in terms of vulnerability, we use different kinds of indicators, the farm diversity, the genetic diversity, the landscape heterogeneity, the level of social organization, the local knowledge, the access to uh, si tienen, uh, resource, access to resources and so on. In terms of response capacity, uh, we decide to measure these indicators, social network, ability to take collective action, community skill to manage biodiversity, soil, water resources, agroecological skills mainly. And we did, um, we have been done a lot of research in Latin America, but I wanted to to show with you this and uh, how we did this holistic risk index uh, comparing four agroecological and three conventional farms in Colombia. So what we did was comparing this in the same region, in the same communities, we select um, three conventional farms and three agroecological farms and to observe in order to observe if they have more or less risk due to climate change. So what we did was to select the same indicators and evaluate the vulnerability. So here we have a different kind of indicators like diversity of the landscape a lot of indicators are associated with soil erosion because they are in, in the slopes and they, are, um, they have a lot of problems with, with the erosion. So we um, evaluate soil structure, compaction, erosion signs. 
and we give get colors. So I mean, if you see red, they are very vulnerable or they have high value in the indicator. Uh, yellow means moderate and, and um, green means low vulnerability. And this is the conventional group of farms compared with the agroecological farms. You can see that they are the same indicators, but we have here more green and yellow compared with the conventional farm. This is with uh, vulnerability. And you can see here the indicators, the physical indicators of vulnerability in the conventional, conventional farms and agroecological farms. And then we compare them. So you can see using this ameba, you can see that the agroecological farms are, this is the optimum. It means that we have less erosion, less compactation, better soil structure if we reach the five, number five. The agroecological farms are very close to, to these indicators compared with the conventional farms. And then we have another indicators associated with the response capacity. And here we have other indicators that are more related to uh, the different practices that are using the food sovereignty, the uh, external inputs, if they use uh, traditional varieties, if they have uh, diversity, uh, biological diverse, functional biodiversity, and if they have uh, species diversity at the farm level. And you can see that the conventional farm had more red and yellow compared with the agroecological farms. And if you, you compare this in the ameba, you can see that there are huge differences between the conventional versus the agroecological farms, far away the conventional farms. Here is because protected areas, but it's very difficult that the small farmers have protected areas or natural vegetation because they are uh, they have very small farms so they cannot have um, natural vegetation and then what we did was this is the risk triangle so probably some of you are agronomists you remember this triangle of the texture but we put here the response capacity the vulnerability and the threat and we plot the with the index we uh, try to, to, to place where are the agroecological farm versus the conventional farms. So if the, if the formula, when we apply the formula, we have the risk indicator, the, the risk assessment is lower than one. It means that they uh, have very low risk. Um, it's one to 1.5 low risk from 1.7, uh, 151 to four medium risk and higher than four is high risk. So here we have in a medium risk, the conventional farms. So I think it's very important at least to plot and to know what are the risks of the farms in order to uh, decide how are we going to do this transition from this uh, agroecosystem management, how we are going to move from system that are very degrading, that are using a lot of inputs that are based on monoculture, fertilizer, pesticide, and how we can move or do this transition toward more sustainable, low input agriculture that requires more information and uh, depends on, on these ecological processes like biological control. So I think in summary, uh, we need to um, reduce all these practices that are creating, um, the, making the system more vulnerable, like for example, monoculture, chemical fertilization, pesticides, uh, total weed removal, conventional tillage. These practices decrease natural enemy species diversity and increase the, pest, um, the population of, of, of pests in the system. So what we need to do is to do this transition. How we are going to do this uh, agroecological transition is to um, increase habitat diversification, use organic soil uh, amendments or management, 
low soil disturbance and tillage practices, use different habitat diversification according if we are uh, if we have um, orchard, for example, we can use cover crops. If we have grains, we can use rotation. We can also use polyculture. We can use strict cropping, hedge rod, wind breaks that are going to increase in natural enemies diversity and reduce or lower pest population densities. And then this is the our main goal is how we are going to achieve sustainable pest management system, reducing the pesticide treadmill, thinking in therapeutic and backups in order to manage this total system management, the holistic approach that we are going to do with the agroecosystem. Sorry. And uh, uh, for that, we need to uh, start with therapeutic approaches. From in this in this conventional agriculture, we used to we used to use pesticides. Now we, we can do this transition using biopesticide, biological, uh, and botanical insecticide, and biological enemies or, or natural enemies. And uh, the other thing that we can do is to, to think that we can start thinking on the ecosystem function or, or as, a, as, a, as a holistic approach. Uh, so we need to do the switch from redu reductionist approach to emphasize and understand the multi-trophic interaction and use these strengths that are very important to maintain um, the stability and reduce the vulnerability of pests. And these are the pillars of ecological pest management. So as I say, we are looking for the uh, agroecosystem health using these two pillars, soil health and crop health. But for that, we need to look for the below ground habitat management, biota activation and diversification. And for that, we can use these practices like soil organic matter, nutrient management, and so on. And above ground, we have different kinds of practices. We can work on habitat management, plant diversification, and enhancement of beneficial fauna with these practices like crop diversity, rotation, cover crop, plant, plant breeding. And in this case, we reduce tillage, maintaining soil cover, add organic matter, nutrient management with the design. This is the agroecosystem design that we wanted to achieve. And just to finish with this framework for ecological crop management is that we need to think that with agroecology, we have to, this is a preventing management, building internal strengths into the system with the crop selection, with the habitat conservation and biodiversity, uh, enhancement in the field and the surrounding, and also building healthy soil low ground, habitat conservation, biota enhancement. So for that, using these two pillars, we are going to stress pests, we are going to enhance beneficial, we are going to enhance plant defenses, and probably we have post-planting management, other practices to prevent, other soil practices to reduce crop stress and optimize yield and quality. And probably we have to react, if something happened, we have reactive management and we need to use certain inputs for pest management. If we have a pest and we need to do something. So we need to know that if we apply a botanical insecticide that allow in organic agriculture, you need to know that probably this, this botanical is also, is going also to kill natural enemies. And also we sometimes need to use reactive soil inputs. We need to understand what are the consequences for that. That probably we need to start again in this inoculated natural enemies and so on. But the overall goal is an optimal crop yield, quality, enhanced landscape aesthetics and ecosystem services 
with positive and environmental effects. And uh, I just wanted to finish with this slide that, that this is a, a clash of paradigms. So here we have a peasant agriculture where the, is the base of agroecology versus industrial agriculture that is the base of green revolution. So it's kind of, we are in a in totally different paradigm, but I think it's very important to know what are the problem, what are the root causes, but also to um, make a proposal of new approach and demonstrate with our research that is possible to produce and to reduce the vulnerability of pests uh, through diversification. Taking this approach toward diversification, I'm sorry, this is in Spanish, this is kind of two routes. This is the, the green revolution or industrial agriculture that reduce biodiversity, reduce stability and reduce resilience compared with agroecological approach that increase biodiversity, stability and resiliency. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate your time and your invitation. Thank you very much, Professor Nicole. As usual, you give us very inspiring lectures. And uh, before we go to the question and answer sessions, uh, can I just recap just for a while uh, your lecture today? It's very interesting that uh, at first you mentioned uh, the fact that we are facing uh, pretty much still monoculture or uh, industrial uh, agriculture until nowadays. You mentioned that 80% actually from total 1.5 billion land is monoculture. And it, it reminds me of uh, what Professor Altieri said uh, last week about uh, the, we are facing actually the monoculture of mines. And that's one of the challenges that we have to face. And uh, for that, actually, that's one of the purpose of this lecture today uh, for our dear students uh, that uh, joining this lecture is to probably shift a little bit of their minds from the monoculture of minds into the diversity of minds. That's our hope, actually, through this lecture. And it's very interesting that you also mentioned uh, that out of eight until 10,000 cross species out there, we actually just rely on four crops and that's that's pretty much sad actually we just rely basically on maize wheat rice and soybean and that leads to vulnerability basically and it's very clear also that you uh, mentions about pest vulnerability uh, the factor that causes the uh, pest vulnerability uh, range from the landscape simplifications to the uh, pesticide that induce insect uh, system, uh, uh, and then the use of fertilizer, the chemical fertilizer, and also the from the climate change factor. It's, it's very clear that you mentioned all those factors just now in your lecture. And it's also interesting that uh, uh, you also give, up, uh, give us the solutions or what we need to do uh, to combat the pest vulnerability. We basically have to conduct ecological restorations and uh, it's a transitional uh, process and is a valuable uh, knowledge also that you give about the factors about the climate resilience, which is threat, vulnerability and response capacity. That's uh, for some students probably uh, is the new concept and thank you for sharing about that. And uh, your last slides basically wrap up uh, the purpose of our lectures. Uh, so if uh, I would like to re uh, inform all the participants here in this lecture, probably from outside Bravija University, actually this program uh, conduct under the course name Agroecosystem Management. So Agroecosystem Management is basically uh, the answers of uh, to combat the pest vulnerability. And uh, it's very beautiful that in the last slide, you uh, remind us about the class of paradigm between the agroecological uh, agriculture versus the industrial agriculture. And uh, hopefully through this kind of lecture, um, the paradigm is pretty much shifted, uh, especially to our students. And for having more interesting discussions about that, I now entertain all the participants here with questions and answer sessions. Uh, so can I take 
first questions. Uh, uh, this is from the chat room. Um, so uh, most of the participants here is actually we uh, wish that we can share the material of the lecture and uh, we will provide uh, the lecture material soon after we. It's okay. It's okay. Take your time, Professor. I understand your situation. I promise that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said that I promise that I'm going to send you to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And there is this uh, questions from Mrs. Saripah Ulfa from UIR. Uh, I'm not sure where is it. Uh, are you here, Mrs. Saripah Ulfa? Do you want to directly ask your questions or shall I read your questions from the chat room? I cannot hear any answer, so I can just read her question. Uh, dear Professor Nichols, quoting your words, that our agriculture trend is shaped by those holding corporate power. Are there any effective approaches to be done to counteract the negative impact of the modern agriculture on the world ecosystems? This is a heavy question, I think. <laughs> but uh, please, Professor, uh, do you have any comments? Thank you, Prof. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Sarif, Sarifa. Sarifa is her name? Yes. Yeah. Sarifa. Thank you for that, that important question because, um, yeah, I think it's, it's um, as a professor, Van der Plok, that I encourage you to read. It's a Holland professor, but he explained very well what is the situation right now with the corporate control of the food system? So now we are in hands of a few companies that are dictating what the producer or the farmers produce and what the consumers consume. It's like, actually it's, we are in that the um, situation where they have, I don't know how to say, but they take us, you know, this, they, they're strangle us. They are dictating what is, what is the situation because they are dominating the food system. And uh, why? Because most of our countries, I, I don't know Indonesia, but in many of the third world countries, because our huge debts are forcing our countries to enter into the free trade agreements. And these free trade agreements, especially dictated by the World Bank, all the huge debt that our countries have, they have to pay the debt and they put conditions. And one of those conditions is that we need to enter into this form of agriculture. It, this form of agriculture that is based on on uh, transgenic seeds or the Green Revolution. Green Revolution was, was established to um, produce more. And also if you are going to enter into the agro export model to pay the debt. And sometimes even if we, if we don't want to, or if farmer need a credit, they have to use pesticide. At least in Cali uh, here in Colombia, 40% of the pesticides have been subsidized. So if a farmer need a credit, they need to use pesticide. Otherwise they don't receive the credit. It's, it's, it's a lot of condition. But I wanted to explain how this condition work because the World Bank lend money to Colombia. Okay, mm -hmm. and they put condition. Okay, we are going to lend the money, but you need to open your economy to the, third world, to the uh, free trade agreement. You need to enter into um, agro expo model. You need to use this package, you know, they, because they think that this is the only way how they are going to achieve productivity and to be economically viable to pay the debt. So this is a mandate that sometimes this is a structural agenda program that make the countries um, very difficult situation, open the door to big corporation to buy land, even to not only buying, but display farmers. And this is what happened with soybean and corn production here in, in, in Latin America with agrofuels, big corporations that are just buying land and land and displacing 
farmers. See, and all the ecological consequences that we already talked, but this is the situation. And this is what Van der Ploeg called the, the corporate food regime. This is how it works. Okay, we have two options, sit and cry <laughs> or do something else. Okay, so I, I think you know me already because I, I mentioned this last time. I'm very optimistic and I think we can create a bypass, a bypass between farmers and consumers. Understand who is creating the problem and how we can overcome this problem, okay? Because um, many farmers had to enter into this logic because they don't have markets. But if they have a solidarious consumers that buy their own products without pesticides, without uh, creating all these uh, environmental problems, consumers that are solidarious with those farmers because they, they are doing the right thing, they are not using pesticides, and the farmers create, farmers and consumers create that alliance. Mm. So, and I think the change, the change probably are not going to be global. The change are going to be local mm. because it's very difficult to, to, to fight against the corporate food regime. And sometimes we paralyze each other because we don't know how, because they don't have visible face. They are corporate. We don't, we don't know who they are. So, but we can act at the local level with our farmers, supporting our farmers. Uh, the students doing research for the farmers that need, for example, strategies, how they are going to manage their agroecosystem, how they can do the transition from conventional to more agroecological approach. For example, these classes, Professor Rina, are very important because the students understand that the kind of research that they are going to do are going to help probably, they are not going to change the world, but they are going to help this, the farmers near their community. So this is the kind of relevant research that we need to do. I think those are the, the effective approaches rather than just thinking that we are going to fight against Monsanto because I think it, 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 it paralyzes us because we don't know how. But we know our strength. Our strength is be together with farmers, with consumers, making this kind of alliances. And Professor Van der Plok talked about the bypass. bypass. Let's do a bypass at the local level. This is more important than just... But one thing that is very important because here we have a lot of students is that we need to think globally, understand the whole picture, the whole corporate, who are the who are the ones that are causing climate change, who are the ones who are really devastating our environment, created all this problem, but act locally with our research, with our farmers, buying in the local farm, farming market and things like that nature make the difference. Thank you for that amazing question because allow me to, to talk about that. <laughs> Thank you for very inspiring quote that you just uh, mentioned, uh, answering the questions from Busaripa. For uh, Busaripa, is there any feedback on Professor Nicole's answers, or are you satisfied with the answer? Yes. Um, can 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 I be heard? Sure. Of course. Yes. Uh, yeah. no, where are you? To open up your camera, I can put you on the spotlight. Um, uh, I haven't found you. Okay. Uh, could you open up your camera so I can put yes. you on the spotlight? It's me. Uh, okay, great. Okay, yeah, it's me. I miss yours, Mrs. Arifa Ulfa. Uh, would you introduce yourself first? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not familiar with the, uh, the name of your university. Yeah, uh, UIR is Universitas Islam Riau. So it's ah. in, in Baru. <laughs> Okay, okay. That's in uh, Sumatra Island, Professor. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Thank oh, you. Oh wow! Great. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. So I think what we need to do is to uh, make a rebel alliance <laughs> around the world, perhaps. Yeah. 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 I have been thinking about that, but you you know. Yeah. 
I'm ho uh, almost hopeless. So <laughs> you say that we we are uh, we should be uh, optimistic. So it's really really uh, fill me in. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Oprah. You know what made me. You know uh, what made me optimistic? Yep. These invitations. So I'm very, I'm very, really, Professor Rina, I'm very honored because we are far away, we are from different culture, but we are in the same mold to change the world. This exactly. made, me, made me hope. So you need to understand Professor Sarif, Sarifa, that you are not alone. There are many people in the world, many young people that are looking for alternatives. And the thing is that the system, the corporate food regime wants us to be hopeless. And we cannot allow that. We need to get together yeah. like this. You know, I, I think the pandemic made something good is yeah. that we can share these lectures talk about the problems that are globally. I can share with you what we are doing here. We can inspire you, you can inspire us. But as a professor, I'm very happy because I know that there are people there that are thinking same with the same uh, dreams and the same hope that I have. So I really appreciate your question and I think this is what this lecture is all about. You know, discuss these important elements to have hope and to work together. And I, I wanted to say that if you need to contact me through email, I will be very happy to help you and to share my lectures, to share my, my, my articles. And someday we can see each other person by person, but otherwise you, you need to feel that we are there, that there are so many people that are thinking same as you. Thank you very much. This is very really, uh, satisfying. Thank you, uh, Professor Opa, uh, for the questions. Uh, that's pretty much heartwarming <laughs> statement from both of you. Uh, let's share hopes uh, through these uh, lectures. And uh, I would like to invite another participants to ask questions. You can both ask your questions directly to Professor Nichols or through the chat room. You can also uh, ask the questions both in English or Bahasa. I can try to translate it for you. Uh, while waiting for the another questions, uh, Professor Nikos, allow me to ask uh, several naughty questions. It's not really naughty, actually. <laughs> uh, we are keep on uh, thinking that modern agriculture or agriculture, uh, industrial agriculture is somewhere the cause of the pest vulnerability, but then at the same time, we also realized that that's the major fact today is that nowadays 80% actually still uh, conducting the monoculture in a really huge area of land. I was just wondering actually um, if we talk about agroecological systems, which is actually a really good system, uh, is there any evidence how wide or how fast or you know how huge this agroecological system actually can be applied or can be conducted in terms of the landscape level until how many hectares, how many hundred hectares uh, that it can be optimally applied about the agroecological system. Mm. Because uh, that's something that we have to convince, right, uh, to the, those kind of corporate or those kind of practitioners. Thank you. Yeah, I think this. This question is very, very important because I say 80% of arable land is in the hands of huge monoculture. Yeah. But these monoculture don't feed the world. Exactly. Yeah, it's like, because 50 to 70% of the food that we eat is produced by a small farmer, not by big corporation. Because big corporation, are producing biofuels, bioplastics, and uh, uh, feed for animals. That is not what the, uh, things, the, right? the majority of the people eat, exactly. So I think it's very important to understand that because there is a lot of inequality in land distribution. 
So 80% of the land is in monoculture. It's kind of, but countries like my country, you know, 80% of the land is in the hands of 20% of the farmers. So it's, yeah, and this is country by country, Brazil, in Col Colombia and Brazil in Latin America are the highest inequality in land distribution. I don't know Indonesia. I don't, I don't have a lot of information from Asia, but probably could be the same, I don't know. But the reality is that the, the corporate food system, they don't feed the majority of people. Okay, and the other thing is that the 20% of the land that is in the hands of a small farmers produce 50 to 70% of the food. They use only 20% of the, or the water because it's, 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 um, it's, uh, they don't have irrigation systems. You know, they don't have what the industrial agriculture have because the state had been very, uh, <clears throat> They have been abandoned by the state. They don't have this, this thing. So <clears throat> I'm sorry. So they don't have irrigation. So they use 20% of the land and 30% of the energy. <clears throat> they don't use input. Sometimes if they have, they, they buy a fertilizer or sometimes they eat, they buy a, one insecticide, but they don't have the economic means mm -hmm. to use a lot of, um, of this, um, sorry. It's okay. Take your time. Of these inputs. So <clears throat> I'm sorry. Answering your question, I can say that we just finished a report about the evidence of agroecology. And uh, we will finish it by there are several people from different parts of the world, from Asia, Latin America, and Europe, and uh, North America that um, we had writing a report. But I can tell you about Lat Latin America, we have a, a lot of evidence demonstrating who is producing the food and how this food is produced and what kind of varieties they are using. So all the evidence that they don't have a, a label of there is, this is produced using agroecological approach, but they are using many of the practices that we use in agroecology because we don't have label like organic, but um, after we read this, you know, worldwide we had more or less 350 million farm, family farms that are using agroecological approach, more or less. But I think after we have this report, we, we are going to, to have numbers that are very important. That, um, but we have a lot of evidence and now we have um, international institutions that are talking about agroecology, like FAO, FAO, FAO. Mm -hmm. uh, we have IPEX, International Palette of uh, IPEX. And there are um, uh, ISTD, the Assessment of Agriculture and Technology, mm -hmm. that mentioned that agroecology is the option to overcome the problem that conventional agriculture have um, led. So I think there are plenty of evidence that demonstrate, but we don't have the number as uh, the question that you ask. But soon we are going to have it. Cross fingers for that. That's really interesting. Um, I can see that someone is raising hand here. I'm not sure uh, the name because uh, ONF. Uh, so dear ONF, could you please open up your camera or uh, ask your question directly to Professor Nichols? ONF, I assume he's, I think the students, because I, I just saw, uh, mm -hmm. saw his face just now actually. Or you're still away? <laughs> Okay, but uh, I'm, I'm, okay. NF, are you here? Or he's gone? But thank you, Professor, for the answer. That's pretty much uh, satisfying. Uh, knowing that somewhere out there, 
already actually conduct a, a work to compile the evidence of agroecological agroecological systems worldwide. That's mm -hmm. pretty much uh, inspiring. And uh, I have to go from point F, which I'm not sure where, to Professor Sahabuddin Saleh in the chat room. Uh, he's um, uh, the senior in entomology in the University of Tadulako, that's in Sulawesi, Sulawesi Island. Uh, now that you're open up your camera, Professor, can I put you on the spotlight? And probably you would like to address your comments there. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. I miss yours, Professor Sabudin. I miss you. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Uh, Clara Nichols, for your interesting uh, lecture. I think we already talking about this topic uh, for several times. I enjoy your uh, lecture for, I think, uh, just uh, in three or two times that hold by uh, U the UV University. Uh, the point is that we have to counteract. Yeah, we have to <coughs> handle the big problem that the big company, I mean, the pesticide company, no over the world has uh, allocated their big, uh, what is uh, effort, yeah, to promote the modern monoculture system. So we also, therefore, we also we also need to to counteract them. I mean, maybe it's possible for us to to build up to like what is a, a, a network, yeah, to promote and to implementing this agroecological. Uh, approach in the department system because uh, yeah this there is a big uh, <laughs> big problem because we we uh, face uh, this uh, big company so by make a more strong uh, network and then we can uh, give the farmers in all the world the the, the best practice and the, of all the, the advantages of the system. I think it is my question for not clarity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Habudin. Yeah. So basically, uh, he asked your comment. Uh, what if we build a network to strengthen uh, the agroecological farming system? What do you think, Professor? No, excellent, excellent question and excellent idea. Excellent question because allow me to to say several things that are very are in the same line that Professor. Because I have to say, I'm an agronomist. I, so I study at the okay. university, uh, agronomist and then entomologist, but I study green revolution, you know, yeah. because this is what they did in the 70s and 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. They put companies, put a lot of money in universities to train us in green revolution in modern technologies, um, modern varieties with inputs. So we never, I don't know you or in another country, but here in Colombia, we didn't study peasant agriculture. We wanted to modernize peasants. We didn't study small farming, even that we have the majority of our farmers are small. So, what the kind of training that we receive as an agronomist were to modernize agriculture. And they have an economic interest that was mainly to push for these technologies, push to, for farmers to get in debt and use these inputs. Unfortunately, uh, this continues. Now at the University of California, um, the research is biased. Mm. The amount of money that the professor receive are coming mainly from big corporations that wanted to, to push biofuels, that wanted to push biotech. And if you are in the other side of the field, like in this network that you are proposing, totally against what modern agriculture is doing for for many years. So you are pseudo scientists or 
you are against science because you are working with the small farmers because you you don't publish in nature or because or because or because and so it's very difficult to receive money to do your own research on diversified farming system it's not easy yeah. and you you are a professor you know what i'm saying it's, it's very difficult because we had to publish we had to do research and we had to publish yeah. and for that you need uh, grants and it's very difficult to get grants from the from the typical um, digamos from, from the typical line of funds. So there is a huge um, divide at the university level because there are uh, people that wanted to push biotech. I don't care if they want, they have their own right to do it, but not at the expense of others ideal that is biodiversified farming system or using agroecology as a strategy. But the good news I can say the good news is that now universities are opening to this approach. Why? Because now we have FAO and big institution talking about agroecology. Because at the beginning in the nineties, when we started with agroecology, we were criticized, stigmatized, and, and another adjectives at the university because we were no scientists. We were hippies that thought that it was possible, that we were dreaming that it was possible. Uh, then they questioned us saying that agroecology can feed the world. Mm. And now, now that international institutions are talking about agroecology, okay, agroecology can work. But I think it, this is good. This is good. I think I have been in all the international conference at Rome by FAO. Um, but you know why? Because we want to defend the identity of agroecology. Because there is a risk. There is a risk of um, cooptation of agroecology. So I think it is important that we were aware about what the other people are saying they are doing agroecology. This meeting also are good to see that there are many people that wanted to change the world. There are many people that want to create this network. And I, I'm, I'm very happy because now I know many people in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, North America, in Australia, in New Zealand, that are talking about agroecology, that wanted to create that network it had been very difficult. In Latin America, we have that network, but uh, I had, uh, we went to Japan and they are crazy with agroecology. They wanted to create another SOCLA in Japan, but the barriers, the language barrier had been very difficult. But I encourage you to start with the Indonesian network, helping each other, sharing each other, having groups, student groups, research groups on agroecology, and we are going to be there to help you, to support you, and to um, send the porras to, to do this kind of work. But the idea is amazing. I think this is, and I think little by little, we are doing this, little by little. Exactly. Little Thank by you, Professor, for Okay, Thank you, question. I think I agree that we have to start with from uh, Indonesian country first, uh, the, community of uh, agroecological society in Indonesia. And we, uh, we already uh, make this connection, have uh, give a, a example to the farmer in Indonesia, then we can make a more uh, big uh, collaboration. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Nichols. Thank you. Thank you also, Prof. Sahabudin for the uh, proposal or, or the idea. Don't we have such network in Indonesia, Professor? Sorry? Uh, so apparently, uh, Today we still don't have uh, Indonesian network of agroecological. Yeah, I, I didn't. So, I, I don't think so. That uh, we, all, we we have, for example, uh, the community of agro uh, technology uh, society. Yes, yeah. but this is just an organization uh, organization that uh, focus on to strengthen the the what is the 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 higher education. Yeah, not not uh, an action. Uh, through 
uh, implementing this agroecological agro uh, approach. So I think uh, we, we can uh, promote this maybe through your institution, uh, UB, and maybe join with IBB and another uh, organization, and then we can uh, step by step, as Prof. Nichols uh, said, to build up uh, this uh, organization. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Let's promote that kind of network uh, through our institution. Okay. Well, we can start. It can be the international board of that network. <laughs> Thank you. No, and, and you know, we can think, Rina, we can re think in a future in a course, five day course or something like that on agroecology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Once we have the course, because this is how we start SOCLA. Oh, yeah. We start SOCLA with, we started with one course and after the course we decide to create a network and then the society. Yeah. And, and after that, each country organized their own Congress. So we have more than 2000 scientists and students and now farmers that belong to this yeah. network. And I think you have, because I, 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 I went to Indonesia also when uh, Via Campesina was organizing the worldwide um, conference of Via Campesina and they have an amazing experience. Also farmers have a very good experience. So you can contact Via Campesina Indonesia that are very strong and university students. Mm -hmm. And together we can, we can um, support you in, in a short course uh, through Zoom. And after that you can get organized. That's it's just an idea. <laughs> More work. Amazing idea. We can conduct something like um, collaborative online summer course in agroecological approach. Yeah. Something like that's going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Almost can be collaborative between UB and your university professor. <laughs> yeah. Because we also uh, <laughs> to conduct mobility program. So anyway, thank you, Professor Sabudin, for yeah. your okay, welcome. amazing yeah. idea. And I have to remove you from the spotlight. Okay. And uh, let's see whether we have another questions here. Uh, uh, there is no more questions in the chat room. So uh, for dear colleague and students, do you have more questions that probably you want to address directly to Professor Nichols? If not, we can probably wrap up uh, the lecture today. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Professor thank Nichols. You. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your invitation and, and take care. And I will be very happy to collaborate with you anytime. Thank you. I, I, I like to requote again your word and your statement uh, just now, Professor, when you say, there is actually our options to whether to sit and cry or just to do something about it. And I'd love to have the second option. We'd love to do something about it. And for our dear students, um, uh, Professor Nicol just now said that probably you're not going to change the world, but you can change your uh, surrounding society. But uh, dear students, through changing your local society, I'm sure one day you can change the world. And uh, I end up this today wonderful lecture by quoting Professor Nichols, uh, quote, let's think globally, but act locally. Thank you very much. I'm Rina Rahmawati. I'm, I'm very happy to be the host of today's lecture. And thank you very much, Prof. Nichols. Let's have the group pictures today. <laughs> Rina, send it to me. OK, OK, I will, I will, Professor. OK, would you please open up your camera? And there is 10 pages, actually. And I would like to start with the first one. And everybody ready? Here we go. One, two, three, cheese. Wonderful. And I have another page. But then uh, the camera is off, so I will just stick randomly. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, all the participants that, that is being patient enough to hear the wonderful lecture of Professor Nicole today. And don't forget, at this, uh, on the 2nd of June, uh, next week, there will be a great lecture also from Professor Altieri. He's actually the husband of Professor Nichols. 
and uh, <laughs> that's going to be the final sessions of the three and one lecture program on agroecosystem management by Brawijaya University. Thank you very much uh, for the attention. Thank you again very much for the for Professor Nicole for your inspiring lectures. Hope to see you again. One Thank day. you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. I Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Terima kasih Bapak Ibu yang telah bergabung dari semua Indonesia. We will share uh, the lecture materials after we receive from Professor Nikos. Terima kasih Bapak Ibu, terima kasih. Saya melihat di sini ada Bapak Ibu dari uh, ada Ibu Heni, terima kasih Ibu Heni. Ada Ibu Elizabeth, terima kasih. Terima kasih Profesor Arifin yang yang masih setia bergabung sampai akhir. Terima kasih Bapak Ibu. Semoga kita kelak bisa mewujudkan uh, ide dari Profesor Sabudin uh, network atau jaringan untuk uh, agroekologi di Indonesia. Dan semoga mungkin suatu saat kita bisa conducting short course ya tentang agroekologi. Itu ide yang menarik menurut saya. Terima kasih Prof. Sahabudin. Ya, kita inisiasi dulu pertemuan awal dari peminat-peminat, baru kita lihat bagaimana formatnya. Terima kasih. Ya. Ya, terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Pak Yohanes. Uh, saya melihat masih di sini. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Bu Karinda. Masih setia di sini. Ada Pak Yudo. Terima kasih. Matur Nuhun. Prof. I Prof. Ici, terima kasih juga telah mengajak mahasiswanya untuk ini tanggal Suk 2 Juni Allah ada lagi. Sukses Mbak Rina, lanjutkan dengan short course. Oh iya, amin Pak, short course ya Pak ya. Sip, saya ikut. <laughs> Sukses. Sebagai lecturernya maksudnya kalau Pak Yudo malam. Ya. Enggak, <laughs> begay begay peserta aja. <laughs> Bagus Mbak Rina, salib dulu ya. Sukses. Terima kasih, Mbak Rina. Terima kasih, Mbak Rina. Terima kasih, Ibu Maternun. Ibu Rianti Maternun. Terima kasih. Oke, okay. sukses. sukses. Bu Silvi ini sebenarnya. Yang punya gawe ini sebenarnya Bu Silvi. Terima kasih banyak ya, Bu Silvi. Tanggal 2, mohon maaf. Saya mungkin belum bisa untuk menjadi moderator. Monggo mungkin bisa digantikan. Bu Sylvie atau yang lain. Atau Bu Karinda. Terima kasih ada Mas Mahendra, masih setia di sini. Walaupun uh, off camp. Terima kasih Pak Agung Yuswana. Terima kasih teman-teman mahasiswa semuanya. Teman-teman mahasiswa uh, Brawijaya University atau dari luar Brawijaya University. Terima kasih. Saya mohon izin uh, leave the meeting ya. Insya Allah uh, nanti akan ada rekamannya di YouTube channel kami, HPT FPUB. Silahkan nanti disaksikan rekaman hari ini di YouTube channel kami. Terima Terima kasih, Bu Rina. Terima kasih, Sehat-sehat, Ibu. Tanggal 2 Juni ya, Bu, ada lagi, Insya Allah. Terima kasih. Oh, ya, apa-apa, Pak. Ini, oh, ini, 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 ini,